Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Tuesday topic. Today's topic is CNHP Reads Climate Justice in Short Fiction uh, with our presenters today, Jesse Ballinger and Sherlock Pearl, both uh, PhDs from the uh, Health Administration Department. And with that, I will throw it over to uh, Dr. Jesse Ballinger to uh, get us started. Take it away, Jesse. Hi. Uh... Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, very excited to um, have this uh, conversation with you. Um, it's been our um, practice, and the one other time we, we've done this series so far, to begin with a moment of silence, uh, particularly as there are things going on in the world that are um, very relevant to what we're doing. In particular, as you probably know, uh, world leaders are gathered in Glasgow, even as we meet here today. Uh, to try to hammer out some kind of agreement for dealing with the climate crisis. So I think it would be appropriate to just begin with a moment of silence, um, sitting with our uh, intentions for that uh, meeting. So um, we really want to hear what you think of these stories. Um, I certainly don't, don't want to spend a whole lot of time having me talk, and, and I, I think um, Shrona feels the same way. But, I, but it might be useful if we began by telling you what we were thinking uh, in bringing these two stories together just as a way to get uh, the ball rolling. Um, and basically, um, I had, I had uh, read uh, the story by Paolo Bassi Gallupi, um, A Full Life, and was incredibly struck and uh, disturbed by it. Um, and then when we were casting about for stories, we read in the collection this story by Lauren Groff, they fit so symmetrically well together. Here you have uh, two um, protagonists who are struggling with the relationship with a person of another generation. In one story, uh, it's a young person um, in uh, struggling with her feelings uh, about uh, her grandmother's um, responsibility for climate change. And in another story, uh, it's an older person who is struggling with um, her younger neighbors um, uh, lack of responsibility in her eyes uh, in terms of how she's acting about climate change. So it seemed like an ideal ve vehicle uh, to pair these stories uh, to talk about how uh, climate change is, is tearing at um, generational relations and, and perhaps causing uh, conflict. So that's what, what we were going for, but we are really interested in hearing um, what everyone else thinks about it. So I think um, we just open the floor for you to sh uh, share your um, your reactions to the stories. And anyone can feel free. I mean, this is a, this is a really nice size group for discussion. So if folks want to just, you know, go ahead and speak. I think we'll be all right. But if anyone's nervous, you can put your hand up, I suppose. Uh, but maybe even sort of to dig in a bit deeper, are there any themes that emerged for you? For us, this idea of generational conflict, climate change, responsibility really emerged, but there are a number of other cross-cutting themes as well. So perhaps if somebody wants to share either their reaction to the relationship between the two pieces or a theme that emerged, we'd love to have your thoughts. Happy to say hello to everyone. Uh, Leon Vinci with CN CNHP in the uh, Health Administration section. Um, uh, definitely, I, I actually think it's a good thing if, in terms of the, the generational issue I think you were talking about, where um, uh, younger folks, certainly than I am, uh, younger folks can, um, I, I'm not saying point the finger and blame, but I am saying that uh, they can have outrage, they can be concerned. And I think that's wonderful because that's helping to drive the the agenda, uh, meaning uh, action for hopefully uh, uh, climate uh, improvement and and um, uh, changes that will uh, make a difference for us. Um, 
my generation and and uh, and 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 uh, older than young folks certainly um, have been part of the user uh, population and and whether that's developed a mentality of of dependence on uh, on carbon uh, uses, et cetera, is kind of another story. But nonetheless, um, uh, we too are concerned about what's what's happening and ha well, has already happened and that we need to um, uh, more than wake up and clearly take action. So I'll just stop there and. I guess this is Dr. Carey. Hi, everyone. I think in addition to add to what Leon just shared, that I know that the millennial generation quite literally is thinking that the generation before them and the generation after them are the ones that quote unquote have ruined the world for them. And they're looking for individuals to be accountable to that. And they're not finding that a lot of individuals are being accountable. They may be trying to think of methods by which to address it or to, to say, oh, this could be better in maybe another 15, 20 years. I saw something this morning about how to collect carbon or how to, that they're doing something in Iceland. Um, and they said, oh, this has been a knowledge base for over 10 years. Well, that upsets millennials. They're like, well, if we've known about this for 10 years and it's been an isolated opportunity, why aren't we doing this to harvest what, what we need so that our, our ozone is more healthy? So I think that the readings kind of illustrated that there's not a blame factor, but the onus isn't, isn't there. And I think millennials are looking for the onus. Kind of interesting to me though, because dusk sort of inverts it a little bit, right? You know, I mean, in in the um, in a full life, we have this kind of clear generational Nona, the grandmother who had lived this very full life and traveled on planes and ate red meat and did all these things that frankly we all still do, despite knowing absolutely that they're highly problematic. And then the granddaughter becomes a climate refugee, which we can maybe talk about in a bit. Uh, and she really struggles with this role of her grandmother as both her savior taking her in quite literally and also the person who caused as part of a generation the destruction. But in Dusk, it's actually the older person who's taking the younger person to task a little bit. But we don't entirely, we're not supposed to trust the protagonist in Dusk. She's an unreliable narrator, right? Jess, you look, you're looking puzzled at me. Do you not think she's an unreliable narrator? Um, she's a, she, no, I think she's a reliable narrator, actually. I, th I think that um, she's in an, an unreliable situation, if that makes sense. I mean, another theme that we should talk about, I think that's strong in both these stories, but particularly in Dusk is the uh, climate anxiety, just, just how debilitating this um, living with this hanging over, it's not even hanging over our head, it's unfolding before our eyes. Um, and it upsets um, our kind of our grasp on the world. And that's, that's what she's experiencing. I don't really see her as unreliable. I, I don't know that we have the grounds to see, like at what point do you think she's not reporting what's actually happening in the story. Like, I, I feel like she's describing, we're meant to see her as describing things accurately. Her reactions are um, transgressive. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're odd, they're deviant, they're not, you know, she, she's sort of not fulfilling her roles. Um, her, you know, there's, there's her husband very um, is obviously worried about her sanity, um, but I don't know that that amounts to in this situation. I don't know if that amounts to an unreliable narrator in the way that I I take it that's usually used, where we understand more than the narrator does what's actually going on. Well, what do the rest of you think in yeah. in 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 dusk? Are we supposed to wholeheartedly trust the narrator? Are we supposed to think that there's some tension 
are, are, is her relationship with the world strained in some way? I mean, cause there are all these hints later where she says, you know, friends were giving her therapists numbers and she couldn't leave her house. And then after she has this kind of blowout with her neighbor, she starts to get better in some way. She talks about leaving the house, going on walks, doing all these things that she hadn't done before. So why is having a big fight the pivot? So let me ask another question. Are there bad guys in these stories? And if so, who are they? You know, and the kind of something Jess and I talked about before is, is this a traditional protagonist antagonist situation? Is Nona bad and the granddaughter's good? Is dust bad? Do we think that this is a case of a protagonist and an antagonist? I think I wanna get back to the, the question about the grandmother for a moment, because what I see when I, you know, Nona, even in the name, right? It brings up all of these sort of visceral reactions to having a grandmother and how they tell stories and how much credence isn't even exactly what you're, you're going for, right? It's the fact that this, this person of stature within the family is sharing, but, there, but she's sharing it from her lens, how she sees the world and how she sees the events that impacted upon her. So whether they be true or not, they could be embellished, they could be less than accurate, but they were her demonstration of at least caring enough to dialogue about it. Um, and then if someone comes in and fact finds or, you know, then they might find that some subtleties were embellished, but I don't think anyone's going to challenge her because of her her um, her status within the family and, and her role. Um, I think that might be a challenge for the reader to actually do that. So I'd love to just get a people, so, I mean, maybe everybody didn't get a chance to read the stories, but I'd love to get everybody's reactions to them for those of you who have read them or from what you're gathering. So I think we're gonna do a little activity and we're gonna just popcorn to people. So I'll name someone and then you name someone to go next. Just a one word reaction or two word reaction to the stories, how you just kind of responded to them. Um, and I guess I'll start. And in some way, I think my word was familiar, you know, in the sense that everything that is being talked about is something that I recognized. It's almost like this Handmaid's Tale moment where everything is kind of horrifying, but also rooted in something that actually happened in the past. And I'm gonna popcorn to Katie. Uh, you know, similar, and I just read them recently, but I kind of feel like, like you said, I always think of like a V8 moment where you're like something that you hadn't really thought of, but it absolutely, makes sense and is real. And I, I want to say eye-opening. And then I have to pop for you. Um, I'm going to go to David, who's below me. I'm trying to get my two stories straightened out. And I refer to the first sec story and the second story. <clears throat> for the first story, I found, found it very interesting that the, the girl there, she um, pretty much accepted the world as it is, is the world that she sees it. Um, and I find that kind of frightening for us as well, our degree of acceptance. When we have the, the tides are coming in and washing away these large cities, that even the barriers that they had constructed against them are no longer going to be adequate for this. So what does she do? She heads up to Boston, you know, so, you know, goodbye, Florida. I'll just go to some place where the um, effects of climate change are not quite as obvious or quite as strong. So I just thought that that was kind of interesting. And also the response when someone decides when she's there and um, trying to get settled in Boston and everything, and then she finds out, okay, there's someone in Boston here who thinks I'm just one of these illegal immigrants. And I find that interesting also, that the refugees from climate change, they're considered basically like illegal immigrants. And that sort of brings us back to what's happening along the Mexico border there. Um, so we sort of in the, incorporated that part, that unfortunate part of our um, situation right now. We've moved that in terms of our response to climate change. But as I say, once again, the people there they don't want these immigrants there. 
they want to help out. They don't want to help out. They just want to keep these people out that are trying to move to safe places there. So I find that when I was reading that, and she doesn't seem to be as upset as I would be. I would be dozens of emotions there, none of them good. Um, she seems to be kind of accepting of it, that this is the way things are. And that I found very uh, frightening, quite honestly, that we can get to that point where looking at that world that she's living in, that this is the way things are and you just have to deal with it. Um, and I think of our recent meeting um, over in um, Scotland now about climate change. And one of the concerns is people are making all these great promises. But the question that keeps on coming up is, are the countries going to really honor these promises? Are they going to be true to these promises? Or are these just words that they're stating? And then like 10 years from now, we'll find out we haven't made all that much progress because the countries uh, spoke a great deal, but you know, but the deal didn't come through. They just weren't able to follow through on that. So those are just a couple of responses that I have, especially to that first story there, which I found very scary again. Can you popcorn it to someone else? Um, who else wants to go? <laughs> I would like to go. I'm Donna. Okay. Hi. So, hi, I'm sorry, I came a little late um, once you had started, so I'm sorry I missed the introduction, but I want to say thank you um, for sending out this invite. So, I read these stories probably a month ago when you sent out, you know, um, I was very excited to read the short stories. I've never been to a, you know, a short story discussion before, so I'm, I I'm not really sure what to expect, but, um, you know, when I read these stories, I, I just highlighted a few things out of both of them. So um, I don't know, for me, um, when I was reading A Full Life, um, that story, I think the very last two paragraphs of the story, um, that really resonated with me because, um, you know, this is Rue speaking. Rue, Rue was saying, you know, Nona says she loves Rue, but, um, Rue just feels at the empty distance between them, right? So um, I guess I was thinking about, you know, climate change, like, you know, Nona saying she, she loves me, but, you know, the way Nona's lived her life and maybe how she's, you know, treated the environment, like maybe she, does, she didn't show her love the best way because she's left me with what I experienced, right? Because Rue can't remember a time um, where something hasn't been on fire or it hasn't been underwater or falling apart or something like that. So um, to me as the reader, I just felt like Rue feels like, well, she says she loves me, but I don't feel loved because if you loved me, you would have tried to take this climate change a little bit more seriously. I mean, that's what I, that's what I took out of that one. And um, you know, for the other story, you know, I'm doing like David, the other story, uh, I don't remember the characters names, but I, I, I do remember you were just talking about the husband, um, you know, saying, you know, I wonder if you're a little obsessed with this girl. Um, do you think this is normal behavior? And the response was, no, I'm doing it for the environment. So I took this a little bit differently in this story. I was like, Sometimes I feel we have people that are like righteous, they're like, you know, climate change, you know, this and that, and we need to do the climate change and you, you need to be watching what you're doing, but they're, they're looking at everyone else. They're looking at the neighbor and saying what they're doing wrong. And I'm wondering if, you know, they need to be more introspective and be like, what can I do differently that's going to impact this climate change like instead of being so concerned that the neighbor is you know what she's putting in her trash or what she's doing here um i wonder if we're all a little bit like that sometimes like um you know we're, we're saying oh this one's she's using plastic bags and she's not taking her you know um reusable one when she goes food shopping and are we checking ourselves how we could be doing something a little bit better um for you know, climate change. So anyhow, sorry, long-winded, but 
those were my takeaways from the two stories about, um, you know, climate change. Not at all long-winded. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's exactly what we want people to share. And the reactions we hope these um, stories uh, get out, and then we can, we, you know, we can talk about them together. So. Um. All right. And I don't know who, who wants to speak next. I like that better than just picking on someone. Maybe someone else wants to volunteer. I can go. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt that the stories kind of highlighted for me a lot of the inequities surrounding climate change and the distance that some people have the privilege to have from it. So like, I, I'm someone who's very aware of climate change and I know it's happening and I try in my life to do things that are environmentally conscious, but I know I'm not doing as much as I can. And I feel like if people who aren't impacted directly from it, you can say, oh, it's not gonna impact me while I'm alive or it's not affecting me. Um, and there's a lot of people who are, are getting the brunt of the, um, of the effects of climate change disproportionately um, from the developed countries, a lot of the, it tends to be the, the negative effects are more, more sharply felt by um, like the global south or people who, you know, may not have as many resources. So I, I think it, you know, it highlights for me kind of that, that dichotomy of the people that it affects directly and the people that doesn't um, and, and kind of the tension that, that that tends to create and the importance of education and, and sharing stories of the people it is affecting directly so that, that we're more aware of, of what's happening outside of our, our scope of our lives. Right, I can I can go back in if that's permitted, but with the first okay with the first story, uh, I thought that that was a very powerful depiction of what our world could become if we just continue along this road there. And for me, um, that yeah, that that was scary enough to make me do more than I'm doing right now. So I would say that the story itself, just the way it portrays this future world of ours, um, you know, it's a great way, uh, as much as all the discussion that we have about the different temperature changes and the like, that that story just really hit me. It made it real, instead of just statistics and numbers and everything and projections of what it could be like, you know, the temperature changes. <clears throat> and, and just simple things, uh, for instance, with the water level, we started out, with agriculture, and then we have, then the um, water table started to go away. And then finally they said, okay, but at least we have, we might not be able to irrigate our crops, but at least we can drill down a little bit more and at least have water to drink. And then that dries up. And then you have to ab abandon that land and go to somewhere else. And then you find other problems um, like the rising tides and so forth that are just washing away cities. And part of the, I guess, naivete of society then saying, oh, but we built these barriers to hold back the ocean that's rising there. And of course, then that doesn't do any good. And say, well, maybe where it's a little cooler, that'll help. You know, as I say, as the story mentions, let, let's go up around New England and Boston, see what happens there. Well, it seems to be working, but we, we kind of sense in our bones that it's not going to be working for long, that the world is in free fall. And, and as they say, that's a very scary picture there. And no one seems to know what to do about it. And in fact, people still seem to be back then in denial, like down in Miami, they're saying, oh, but you know, we have this wonderful barrier that we've constructed and everything which is fine until it collapses and it doesn't work anymore. Um, so our response to the whole thing 
that's kind of scary too, that even when it's happening, even when our world is in free fall, we think we're still in control. We still are in that aspect of denial. And I think that's one of the problems that we have today. Um, but we have it projected in terms of what it's actually going to mean years from now, if we continue with this aspect of denial and making promises and say, oh yeah, we'll do this, we'll do that and everything. Uh, and then we don't follow through on those and just use that um, expression, let nature take its course, that that's what we're doing. So as I say, going back, that first story was the one that really grabbed me again. Okay. Anyone Before else? anyone else jumps in, I want to just really quickly respond, I think, to, um, well, to all of the comments, but it's really what Donna McDonald said is really kind of resonating in my head so powerfully. How, how is it that you could claim to love me and destroy my future? You know, I have three kids and I, I'm just really sitting with that right now because that's just a statement of fact. This is not, there is no new information here. And yet, I mean, we're talking about the earth being uninhabitable, not in 2000 years, but in my great grandchildren's lifetime, right? And how is it that I can claim to love them? And sure, like I have a compost bin, but I also got on a plane a few weeks ago, right? I, it's just all of these questions. What do we do with this? And, you know, I, 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 we talk about this a lot in our house and my husband often says, like, it's fine that we have a compost bin, but actually that, you know, the, the issue is a massive geopolitical one. So just as opening intention that it's nice for individuals, but this is actually a problem that has to be solved on a global and corporate scale. You know, that gets me back to the comments about what can individuals do that some people were framing as well, like, in, on some level, I read Dusk as a, as a story of futility. So this young woman who's saying like, it really nothing matters. Like I can buy all of these things and it makes no difference. You know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do we balance all of these things? Is, is, the, is the acknowledgement and the guilt itself a, a useful emotion, even if really we need governments to change the rules? I don't know. Can I claim to love my kids? I don't know. I don't want to, I, I, one of the difficulties of this format on Zoom is you can't tell who might be just ready to say something. So, so I apologize and I don't want to uh, be uh, monopolizing the floor, but I just need to respond. I mean, I think both of these stories in, in ways are about what we're losing uh, to climate change. And when I read both of them, I think what I felt is what we are losing most preciously is relationships. You know, when I got to the last paragraphs, as I think it was um, Donna um, McDonald who said, you know, those last few paragraphs, as it happens, I was about to get on a plane to go to a conference on um, aging. <laughs> um, but um, I read those uh, paragraphs and, and I just felt the gravity of losing the relationship between generations, like, like that, that is really under threat here. I mean, and, and you know, obviously not to, to minimize sort of the um, uh, the the economic burdens, the you know, the physical environment, all of that. But we are really facing a way in which this world will will tear us apart and and tear at our most precious relationships. So I'm just. They're both deeply frightening. And if I can put a word in, I think people for for very good reasons maybe resonated more with um, a full life. The one thing we haven't talked about in Dusk is um, sort of the, the closing parable. It's a very strange ending, sort of like there's no, there's no real resolution with how she's gonna be with the, uh, the this uh, person across the street, although you, you see the door is shut and this person, at least, at least the narrator feels this person has written her off as another pathetic old as her um, 
phrase is. Um, but, but it ends with this incredible like uh, daydream she has about what is going on with this dog, right? And what bothers her most isn't, yeah, the packages are bad and all of that. But when she brings a dog into the picture and this dog is barking all day long and she just imagines this scenario where this dog had been rescued, you know, from um, uh, one of the storms, like had been orphaned in one of the storms and it ends with her imagining what this dog had gone through, that it had been um, left alone in the storm, reassured all this, and its entire world is blown away, right? Its entire relationships with people are blown away. I just think it's, again, it just hit me. That's what's at stake here. Um, it, it's, it's how we can relate to one another. And I guess, um, you know, these are two, I think very frightening, visions of what, of what can happen to us um, in the coming decades. Again, if anybody wants to jump in. Yeah, sorry that didn't come out as Let us know, but I also really want to respond to that, Jess. Um, you know, when you were talking about distance and proximity and our most sacred relationships being torn apart, you know, I've read a decent amount of the kind of post-apocalyptic fiction the kind of Emily St. John Mandel sort of, there's some sort of pandemic or mass event that wipes people out. And one of the things that happens in all of these novels is that you form these small, fierce new communities, right? Everybody has died, everybody in your family, you're, you think you're the only survivor, you wander around an urban wasteland and you find like one person here and one person there and these new families reconstitute themselves and that's a feature of life and when you were talking about distance and proximity it made me think of both that the way that the the new version of the world is going to redefine not only distance because you when you don't have planes and trains and telephones and all these things distance becomes a very different thing and relationships right because you you form relationships with survivors but when you say like this new, that's my cat, this new version of the world is going to tear these things apart, you know, like we both not being American, we haven't seen our families in two years, right? Like we're already beginning to see how these, how the, the kind of environmental realities of our world are limiting the frameworks in which we can interact. And I think that that um, a full life really gets at that. She she never saw her grandmother, right? At some point, that would have seemed wild for people living in the same country. But now we have a new understanding of what it might mean to actually never see your closest relationships because of the environmental scenarios. And we we thought we were lords and masters of this world, right? And we redefine distance. The Chival Bush argument about the train and the Carolyn Marvin, our argument about the telegraph, we shrunk time, we shrunk space, we made the world a smaller place and we owned it. And it's, you know, tied up in notions of colonialism, settler colonialism, lords and masters, like quite deliberately that kind of terrible notion of hierarchy and power and went out and, and thought that, that, you know, sort of the white Western model would make the world a smaller place. And in fact, what it's doing is making it unimaginably big and fractured. And that starts with these families, but it spreads out. You know, this is the, these are white stories. I mean, we don't really know for sure, but they are sort of stories of imagined dominance falling apart. So does anyone else have anything they want to share before we move to the we, we do have another set of things that we wanted to just ask as we yeah, close sure, this yeah. up. Oh, yeah, excuse me. I thought, I thought that I was uh, unmuted there, but here I am. One of the things that uh, especially interested me also is human behavior, how it seems to be incapable of truly dealing with the disaster that's in front of us, um, whether it be leading up to it over decades 
or whether we're finally there. But it seems as though we, we look for smaller coping ways, S small, just something, some small thing to grasp onto to make us feel as though, all right, I'm a little bit more in control of this right now. Just feeling totally wiped out is something we try to resist. Um, and of course, we see it coming. We see it coming, as they say in, in that first story there, where we look at the wells drawing, drying up and everything. And then we have to just let that landscape go as barren landscape now that was um, once orchards and the like. Um, but we don't grasp it. We don't fully grasp what's going on. And, and I think that we see that today. And I'm going back to that uh, in Glasgow, the conference that's uh, been going on. That yes, we talk about it. We can put it into words and everything. But somehow the words are lacking a, a real rooting in reality that we recognize. If we recognize that um, we do something more about it than we're doing. You know, it is, it's just like empty words that sound good, that sound promising. And if we do this, we'll be fine. And it makes us feel comfortable. So, and we see where it leads. We see where it leads. And we see that apparently human behavior over the decades that increases the, um, the, the de devastation that's been caused by climate change. Um, you know, we, somehow we adapt um, without really making meaningful changes, without really seeing this is what we have to do if we're to avoid this disaster. We can see the disaster. We can recognize it. We can feel it, but not enough to really make a difference. All right, that's me. <laughs> I wonder if these stories help us get at, at uh, in any way, um, why we, uh, why that is a typical human reaction. Uh, why we um, seem to both be able to grasp this problem, um, but not really um, deal with it either. Um, it, it, do they offer some insight on that um, tendency? And I think uh, Jess's question is part of a larger provocation that we wanted to present, which is what is the point in a way of reading fiction like this? Or what is the point of a program like this? And on the one hand, you know, speaking personally, I think collective reading is a powerful way for us to think about certain kinds of questions. I think art really inspires us to feel in certain kind of meaningful ways, but is this an activist act? Are we actually doing anything about the problems raised in these books by talking about them or not? I mean, what interested you about this program to come, if I may be so bold? And does that help us get at these questions? Well, for me, one of the things, it awakens me but the, but the problem is it doesn't stick. It doesn't, I, I, I know that a couple hours after reading the story, I'm gonna slide back into my old self. Yes, it was a revelation, a scary revelation. Um, and something I know that I have to be focused on more, but the small things of everyday life seem just once again to creep in and push away those larger, scary issues that, and, and make me feel as though, well, you know, really I can do a couple things, um, you know, like recycle or compost or something like that. Um, but really, what difference is that going to make? And you, you could become a little bit complacent again. Um, and you say, yes, I see where it's all going to lead, but that's going to be decades away. And, you know, I'll probably be out of here by then. And what, that's one of the things that, to me, the whole experience of reading the stories, the stories provided that shocking awakening of this is what you're, this is what the world could be, that we have the power to destroy this world, this planet. Um, and maybe we'll have some animals that are left that have managed to adapt what most likely humans won't be a part of this whole thing. But for me, it, 
at the same time, it's amazing. I'm amazed at myself how complacent I can later become. Um, just that it doesn't seem to have that impact anymore. The impact lessens more, it, the impact grows greater more and more. It lessens more and more as time passes for me. And, you know, I look around at my yard and everything, and I start to feel comfortable again about my home and so forth. <clears throat> and that story becomes more of a distant memory or a projection of something in the distant future, but less rooted to where I am in the present. Uh, so it was the experience of reading the story and my response to it and my after response to it. That was one of the things that really struck me too. To kind of piggyback on what David was saying and then what Sharona talked about when you said that your husband says, well, it's great that we compost or that we take the cloth bags to the grocery store and all of that, but really there's a lot more that needs to be done. And uh, my husband's actually said something similar to that. I mean, by the way, we do the cloth bags and we don't compost, but we do recycle and all that. Um, and my husband says, because he's a pilot, that he contributes a lot more to pollution just flying an airplane. Um, but I think what we can do, yes, all the little things help, but something that we can do is just individual people is just vote. Voting for people that support initiatives that are going to protect the environment. So that's what I would say. So I'm going to do my produce bags. I'm going to use my, I'm going to drive my partial low emission vehicle around, <laughs> around Philadelphia, New Jersey, but I'm also going to vote for politicians and leaders that support um, efforts that are going to protect the environment. Hi, it's Donna again. I wanted to, um, I guess, respond to your question sort of about, you know, what attracted me to this. So for me, um, I have received emails before, you know, about joining a book club or whatever, but I just know demands from work, family and school was too much. But what attracted me to this was you said it was short stories. And then also it was uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then climate change. So I think it's the way you maybe sent out the wording for this, um, you know, particular, you know, meetup that it attracted me to it. And, you know, some, I guess, you know, we hear, we've been hearing a lot lately about, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion. We've been hearing a lot about climate change. So I think sometimes, you know, I, I'm, you know, getting a lot of the facts and the figures and things like that. So when you said there'd be a short story, sometimes we need a creative spin on things or, or you know, something that's fictional sometimes, um, you know, because I think sometimes we hear facts about, you know, how much, you know, CO2 we're giving off or how much, you know, that plastic bag is contributing to this or how many years it takes for the styrofoam to break down like like I have all that like I we get we get that we get plenty of that through the media but I think this is more powerful sometimes when you read you know um the author's words and like it just resonated with me uh like you said Sharona about you know well I have three kids well I have five kids too and it's I think those lines like you're thinking well wow, that was a powerful statement because, um, you know, if you love me, you would, you know, you'd make an effort to do a little bit more about the climate change. So I, I don't know. I think, I think the storytelling uh, is more effective sometimes than these cold, hard facts that we're inundated with over and over. I don't know. So anyhow, that's why I was attracted to this. <laughs> Hello, Leon again, I'm back. Um, I had a... Oops in my signal. Um, yeah, I, I mirror what Donna said uh, in terms of what caught my eye to, to, to be on today's call. Um, uh, you know, um, five years ago, um, positions for social responsibility in, in um, uh, Philadelphia had a town hall and I was on their panel. And, um, uh, you know, we've been talking about climate uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, where I live, uh, which is miles away, um, we, um, we um, too many local groups, but one of them 
uh, is a faith-based uh, climate initiative. And um, uh, we have a reading, you know, uh, a reading book, uh, a, a book club that uh, does key, you know, uh, group um, reviews, and that's an on, a, on an ongoing basis. Um, the, the group does other things, which I'm more involved in than the book club, but just to share that th those kinds of things uh, do bring people together, get them talking, and as you heard, hopefully, uh, whatever one step or two step uh, first step actions, those are good. I mean, it's better than nothing, and we need to move in that that same direction. So um, uh, I, that's another reason I was kind of attracted to to this uh, session, where I uh, just wanted to jump in and and uh, 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 hear what was being presented and and uh, have this dialogue. Hi, this is Levon Jones. <laughs> Forget her, you pinch up. <laughs> um, hi, guys. Um, and I guess in response to what Dr. Pearl said, how as far as the fiction and how it is, now, what I think is that it depends. It meets everyone where they are. So when David Flood was talking about, you know, I read it. And then, you know, but I probably won't follow through. So it depends on, I think it depends on your age. And it, and it may also depend on whether you're male or female sometimes. And I know it sounds weird, but I think sometimes like, like David said, you know, I, I may um, use, we may use bags like um, Sharona, you talked about, about using, I'm the same way. I don't compost. I live in an apartment. I don't compost, but I recycle. I use my own bags and stuff and, you know, and I'm trying to be conscious of the environment and what we're going through now. But at the same time, I know that I think about this world in the future of my seven grandkids. I, I know what my age group has done to this planet. So my concern is more so for the future. So I feel like when a younger person will read, you know, some of these books, they'll they might say, you know what? We've got to do better. We've got to do better than the people before us. That's what I felt. So I don't know how everybody else feels about that, but I felt that I think sometimes it really depends on where you are as far as age-wise. Sometimes some people can say, well, you know, hey, yeah, well, you know, this happened when I was in my 20s and 30s. You know, I lived, I did such and such and such. And, you know, and they're trying to be conscious now. But then there's a group of young people that are like, no, we really got to clean this environment. We really got to do better. So, you know, there, there, there is that. So, One additional comment, if I may do so. One of the things that was going through my mind as I was reading about the future of climate change and everything in these stories. <clears throat> Coronavirus, um, that's something, that's a disaster, obviously threatening our world population and everything, but it's something that was immediate, that's in my face every day, and it makes a big difference. Climate change is something, yes, I can read about it and say, oh, isn't that terrible? And you know, talk about it and read stories and like, but then I can push it away. It's not like in my face all the time. So I think that that also would be a big thing. I read about these disaster stories, for instance, rivers ro roaring through Europe and destroying communities and the like. Um, <clears throat> I read about all these things and I see like broadcasts about them and everything. Um, but it doesn't affect me in the same way. I can say, yes, that's terrible, but it's not really affecting me. Whereas something like coronavirus, it's like in my face. Even if I don't have corona, it's around me. It's affecting COVID. my life. COVID. Go, excuse me, COVID. <laughs> my wife is saying COVID rather than corona, but yeah, COVID. Well, it is corona too, but COVID, you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> that it, it's it's... It, it's affecting my life, uh, even in terms of things that are shut down, buildings that are shut down, businesses that are shut down, uh, things that I go to try to do and I say, oh, I can't do it because they're not available right now. Um, that has a different type of impact on me than something that's a little bit more abstract, something that's maybe more in the future, 
you know, it's, it's progressing, but relatively slowly uh, in comparison with COVID, for instance. Um, so I think that that's something that occurred to me as well. So say one of the things I've been doing with this is analyzing my responses to different types of disasters, of different ways of presenting the disasters and how I'm responding and also why, because I think that that will give us, a, that hopefully would help us decide, well, what can we do to change some of this to give us a better, a more appropriate response to the looming disaster that we have. Right, and that's my comment. Katie, I saw your, your um, we're on muted a second ago. Did you wanna add something? I, yeah, I just think that's such a great point. And I, I hate to even admit this, but I know it's a safe zone that you're right. Like when I think about COVID-19, it's like so impactful and I get so angry about things. Um, and I feel like I need to take my anger and, you know, um, all the emotions that I have with COVID-19, with gun violence, all these things that are kind of more, as, as uh, David Flood said, in your face to think about climate because it does sometimes seem like more of an abstract thing. Um, but I know that, you know, I was thinking about in August when we had the hurricane and like tor the, the tornadoes that hit, I live in Montgomery County, and we had tornadoes that hit. And, you know, I kept thinking, this is not normal that these are hitting, you know, in the middle of Montgomery County. And to, I think it was Leah's point, when we think about, you know, these local elections, like it's so important that people are, you know, focused on climate control and all that, because it absolutely is going to impact our future. And, you know, I hate when it's like, what's in it for me? You know, if something's not impacting you right now, you might not be focused on it. Um, but I think this is so important to bring to light. So I'm glad that you did. So our hour is um, almost up. Um, um, David, I don't know if you got an email we sent to you a, a little while ago. And uh, you had sent us an email in which you actually shared a poem you wrote. Um, and, and we actually thought it would be a great way to uh, both, uh, uh, Sharon and I thought it would be a great way to actually end our session. Is that is that possible on your end? Do you have that anywhere handy? My wife is going to get it right now. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> um, I'll vamp but, a couple of points until that's ready, just in response to what people said. Um, I mean, one thing about, um, I too have been thinking about how quickly and drastically our world changed with the uh, COVID pandemic. I mean, a couple things I would say is one, this isn't, this shouldn't have been any surprise. If we'd been paying attention to the experts, it's been this kind of same abstract. They have been telling us literally for decades, there is going to be a pandemic. We are not, we are not prepared. We are not doing the, 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 the things we should. So, so to me, it, and the second thing to say is it is very in fact related to climate change. Uh, both in terms of, of uh, the likelihood of future pandemics. We don't know precisely uh, a climate role, but we are, you know, with deforestation, we are bringing species together. They will um, interact in ways that produce this kind of emergency that is also predictable in, in, in the climate change scenario. So, um, I do have one yeah. quick thing, Jess, that I want to yeah. piggyback on what you were saying. Um, so I used to be active duty military, for those of you who do not know. I wrote my very first, I used to work in emergency management. I was a um, medical contingency planner when I was active duty. I wrote my very first pandemic influenza plan in 2007, to your point. 2007 was when I wrote my very, very first one. And that wasn't the only one that I, that I wrote. But yeah, that's a very good point, mm -hmm. Jess. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, David, are you, um, ready? Oh. I am all set here. Okay. It looks like here. Leanne wants to make one last point and then, and then we'll go to you to bring us to a close. Leanne? I think I accidentally unmuted, but that's okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> never resist the opportunity to have a microphone in front of me. Right. <laughs> 
Um, no, I think um, uh, the wrap up comments are, are very good from Merritt and others. And um, yeah, I'm interested to hear David's uh, comment. So let's hear the poem. Okay. Okay, David. Thank okay. you. Just to give a basic framework for it. Um, it's talking about the glaciers melting away and using that as a metaphor for someone who's getting Alzheimer's. You know, his mind starting to melt away in the same way. So, and, and the way he relates to it. So here we go. It's called the vacation. I've been concerned about my mind of late. Nothing dramatic, mind you, just bits and pieces of thought that refuse to connect or resurrect or even intersect. But we all have memory lapses as we age, don't we? Today though, I cannot worry about such things. Today, I am on vacation, exploring glaciers, frozen worlds, thousands of years deep. According to our guide, each year of Earth's atmosphere is accurately preserved in these icy blue layers. Like rings of a tree, she thoughtfully adds. I'd better write that down. Each year, another layer of atmospheric memories. But recently, she concludes, she continues in a different tone, the layers melt, evaporate, quicker now than they can form. So the previous years, my mind wanders as she drones on, even centuries, my sweater is too warm, even on this glacier, have disappeared. I wonder if I will ever find those, that, spare kit of, uh, that spare set of keys. Disappeared, she repeats as a refrain, into the sky. A ghostly vapor rises around me and is lost in the blue. An ocean, I peer into the nebulous mist and quickly look away. Gone. This has been no vacation. There is no escape, only disappearance. And that's it. So that's once again, using that metaphor, this person trying to deal with Alzheimer's, having difficulty doing with that. And also at the same time, having difficulty dealing with this whole idea of uh, glaciers melting and climate change. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you everybody uh, for your contributions, for being part of this. Um, and I, I think we're, um, we're done. And thank you all. This was a really inspiring conversation. I'm grateful. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for the discussion.